topic for today is the radiation safety and fluoroscopic uh, for fluoroscopically uh, guided procedures. I'm going to start with the radiation uh, agencies that regulate the safety and protection. Uh, there are multiple of those. Uh, I have listed four. The first one is the state regulatory agency that has the widest range of the regulations. Uh, they basically perform um, inspection, compliance with enforcements of both occupational safety and radiation control regulations. The U.S. Center for Devices and Radiological Health under the Food and Drug Administration uh, regulates standards for new equipment that produces r r r radiation. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulates safety of people who are exposed to the X-rays as well as um, radioactive substances. And there is overlap between those agencies. At the local level, institutions can also create their own policies that are stricter than federal and state regulations for the purpose of keeping radiation exposures uh, to ALARA. ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. Uh, personal and patient safety consideration. Uh, the goal of radiation safety program is to keep the risks radiation to workers to levels that are comparable with those of other safe occupations. The guiding philosophy is ALARA. Uh, there are a lot of the occupations that can uh, that increase the risk of r radiation, and not just not just the X-ray uh, techniques and the f fluoroscopy personnel, but also a lot of those who work with an, in the nuclear medicine, CT scans and um, and other imagings. Uh, practices of Alara, uh, the way that's performed is through an uh, application of personal dosimetry. Usually there are two levels set. One is the legal annual, which is upper level, and the lower level is set by the institutions uh, to the local standards. A quality control by the above agency. Um, if there is unexpected high dosimetry value returned, then ALARA implies that an attempt is made to explain the cause. Uh, those limits uh, are based on an effective dose equivalent and a difference in tissue sensitivities. Uh, those equivalent and equivalent dose seems the same, right? But there is a little bit of the difference. Uh, the dose equivalent is the product of the absorbed dose and the quality factor. The traditional unit for the dose equivalent is the REM. Um, equivalent dose is the product of the average absor absorbed dose in a tissue or organ and associated with the radiation weighting factor. So the equivalent dose considers also the tissue and the organ. Uh, the unit of equivalent dose is the joule per kilogram that is sievert. One sievert is equal to 100 re uh, rems. And sievert currently has been used as the dose equivalent. REM has been replaced by the sievert, but is still used in radiation protection regulations. And but dosimetry re still reports of in REM as millirem. Uh, tissue waving factor, uh, different tissues waving factors have been defined for the determination of dose equivalent and effective dose. Waving factors relate to the risk associated with cancer for different organs and the risk of creating heritable effects from future offspring as a result of radiation dose. That's obviously of effects of on the genes and uh, cell divisions. Uh, then the uh, nuclear Radiation Commission defines new quantities, the total effective dose equivalent, called TEDE, and the total organ dose equivalent, TODI, for specific organs. Uh, the limits are set annually. There is no allowance for the lifetime limit. Uh, for those limits for the X-ray workers, the annual TEDI limit is 5 rem, or 50 uh, sieverts. Um, the example of the organ, uh, TODI is for the lens eye of the eye is 15 rem, uh, the annual dose. The other organ or tissue is limited to 50 sieverts. Okay, again, the optional rules are set by the SSRCR, this is Suggested State Regulatory Commission of Radiation, specifically for fluoroscopists. Uh, these rules are for estimating effective dose equivalent flu for fluoroscopy personnel who are likely to exceed 
DNRC defined whole body deep tissue equivalent limit of 50 sievers in a year in a the normal performance of their work. Uh, the SSRCR rules require uh, wearing uh, dosimeters to assess uh, the annual dose. Uh, the one that it's um, required is unshielded dosimeter worn at the neck and additional dosimeters that are recommended are one under uh, one is the one under the apron of 0.5 millimeter lead equivalence and another one is the ring dosimeter so we're supposed to wear all three we s yeah this uh, when we wore three they have much closer approximation of how much your annual dose is exposure dose so you mainly wear just one right? you can mainly one and they basically what they do is they can apply certain um, uh, Are we supposed to wear the formulas one? to calculate. Are we supposed to wear the one on the outside then? Yes, at the neck. Because that, that also shows a lot how much of the radiation goes to your lens as well as uh, the organs that can basically deduct by that 0.5 millimeter lead equivalence, the reduction, uh, the amount of radiation to other organs. The one which they may not do is the ring dosimeter because that's usually the closest to the field of the of ra 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 radiation uh, the way to, to wear it is uh, the dosimeter should be placed on the palmar side of the hand facing the patient basic principles of vector safety um, obviously one of the most important is being on time consideration as the duration of the exposure of the individual is directly proportional to the occupationally received radiation dose. The more of the time you use, there will be more radiation. Um, minimize the total beam on time for procedures through judicious use of exposure switch to ensure that, I I that ra radiation is occurring only when the fluoroscope is actively viewing the image. So when, once you set up the fluoroscope to view the image, you press the button when you're ready and you are ready to look at the image. Right? So frequently, when sometimes what we will do, we'll change the oblique or rotation and, and do a s s slides of images which m uh, might be unnecessary, right? So I would probably advise to use an um, a image view when you set already the oblique or, 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 or ro ro rotation the fluoroscope you think would be the most appropriate to view the area where you want to do injection. Um, X-ray beam and its interactions, scattered r radiation. Uh, this is uh, the picture that uh, shows scattered r radiation occurring from the X-ray tube on the pathway to the image intensifier, uh, patient being in between. Uh, <coughs> so there are few of the scattered r radiations um, depicted here. Um, the primary scatter is occurring basically from the patient. The another one, secondary scatter, is occurring from the barrier. That usually is, it's the image intensifier itself or the ceiling if it's lower enough. And the another one so that can happen is tube housing leakage. The sum of, of all is called stray <coughs> radiation. As the beam is sent up to the image intensifier, each level gives you atten a certain amount of attenuation. So the table, the patient, and whatever you have on the pathway, right? Okay. Location of the beam within the patient. This is the example of the how much of the attenuation is um, occurring depending on where you put the tube and image intensifier uh, relative to the patient uh, axis, right? So when the field is closer to the proximal side of the patient, the scatter radiation penetrating the patient is less attenuated by the patient. Right? So sometimes when you put the patient at the table, you make sure that the tube is as much as possible in the center of the patient body. Right? Okay. Um, Backscattered ra radiation. There are two different ways that the fluoroscope is positioned one that the x-ray tube is above the patient and another one that the x-ray tube is below the patient. So the amount of the backscattered radiation is occurring when it 
is reflected from the patient's surface toward the operator, right? And the same way is occurring when you have exit to position below, scheduled radiation is from the table down toward the, uh, the waist, and, uh, waist down, right, of the body part. Okay, uh, easily you can see where you can actually apply and what kind of shielding you can apply here, right? We have a special apron, uh, lead apron that fits on the table to protect the bacterial radiation when you place the extra tube below the patient table. Yeah. Do, do you ever use that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, when you put a lateral view, you can s just slide it. You can open it. It's quite easy, actually. I just noticed it yesterday. Yeah. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> we used it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Equipment quality control. Um, these are the collimation and pulse mode versus continuous fluoroscopy. That. Uh, are techniques to decrease the amount of scattered ra radiation to protect yourself from the r unnecessary ra 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 radiation. Use of the collimation can decrease the area, um, might be expected to decrease the rate of scattered radiation to the operator. Also, reduction by the factor of two um, can be achieved by applying pulse mode fluoroscopy versus continuous fluoroscopy. Okay, inverse square law. Um, the ray spacing is related to the radiation intensity. Uh, as the surface area of the sphere is proportional to the square of its radius, the radiation intensity decreases proportionally as the square of the distance from the point source. This is the picture that views how much of the radiation you can um, achieve depending where you, how far away you stand from the point source right, of, of the radiation. This is the person who doesn't have an apron on it, right? So it runs away. Okay. The inverse relationship between the source of the radiation and distance from that source implies that small changes distance have the largest impact on radiation intensity very close to that source. Okay. So that's another view how three different fluoroscopic geometries affect radiation uh, from the X-ray tube being too close, the B being the normal uh, appropriate uh, position, and C with the uh, tube, it's too far away from the, uh, from the, from the patient. Now, in, in A, uh, the exit tube is too close to the patient, and uh, that's indicated by the large change in the x-ray spacing between the entrance to and exit from the patient. Right, and that that view actually might be quite difficult to perform any procedure that's only done for like X-rays. The in picture two, the X-ray tube is actually the X-ray X F. -F. The X-ray is, uh, is too far from the patient, so what happens is that the image intensifier sends the information to the X-ray tube to generate more ra 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 radiation that can penetrate the patient and give you adequate view. That's done automatically. Right? Same thing happens when you have a very thick patient. Also, the image intensifier will send information to the X-ray tube to increase the intensity of, of ra ra radiation to create adequate image. Now, uh, you know, those digital uh, fluoroscopies that are now made for a couple of past years, they automatically can adjust, but also can they digitally extract the view, so they usually create much less changes in uh, radiation intensity based on the attenuating factors. Pulse, the pulse dose is that, that's the third button, right? Uh, the pulse dose you set on the machine. Uh, uh, X-ray attenuation and shielding. Uh, shielding involves the use of protective barriers, uh, mobile barriers that may be rolled into position inside radiography fluoroscopy suites to protect individuals. So those typically are the booth with the glass behind. Ceiling suspended barriers. Uh, that's are important when you are performing a lot of the procedures with X-ray tubes quite above uh, the patient. 
and flexible protective clothing that we are used the most that consists of apron, vests, skirts, thyroid shields and gloves. I actually we should have. Are they like regular gloves or are they real thick no. and heavy? Yeah, they, they are thick and heavy and the problem with the gloves is that because they are thick and heavy, the feeling you have in the hand, it's, it's changed. You have to really get used to those. You use it, the more you use it, it probably will be more comfortable. I also hear that those gloves, I don't know if this is true or not, they increase scatter. Is that true or no? Um, it depends on the material composition. But they can greatly reduce. They can greatly reduce the amount of ra radiation going to your hand. Where do we? We need, we need to ask Susan to order them. And then you put sterile gloves over them. No, I've seen. No, they are sterile. Th yeah. is there, they become like sterile. Like but black. Yeah. Okay, it's not like yeah. It's not they're like sterile. They're, they're usually. Oh, they're the they're those thick ones, the eights that we have, like two, like two month and a half ago. No, 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 no. no. They usually are colored black or brown. <coughs> yeah, these ones dark brown, brown or Dr. Doro has them permanently implanted inside. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they're also stem. Under the skin. <laughs> um, Excess attenuation and shielding. The National Commission for Radiation Protection recommends that the facilities be designed to limit occupational doses to a fraction of annual cumulative dose, limit of 10 millisievert, which is one RAM, that's much lower than the set guidelines <coughs> for annual exposure, and limit doses to others not occupationally exposed so that they do not exceed uh, one millisievert, so ten times less annual effective dose. Uh, principle of attenuation, the amount of radiation attenuated by a material depends on the elemental composition of the material its thickness and also the energy of the radiation passing through the m m material. Uh, lead historically b has been used as an effective shield because of its high attenuation. The amount of lead required for safety purposes is typically 0.5 millimeter or more of lead equivalent thickness for aprons. The transmission through 0.5 millimeter of lead is 3.2% at the 100 kilo volts and 0.36 at 70. What is that? Um, this is the uh, the amount of the radiation power going through the potential. Yeah, potential. <laughs> Composite materials are currently used, tungsten, barium and lead, that basically what they do, they lower the mass or weight of the aprons by 15 to 25 percent with similar attenuation. The, the kilo volt potential, how is that, what is that in, in terms of the radiation that we're getting? I mean, is that something that we can adjust? Or um, specific to the basically, the, yeah, the best way, the machine itself will show you how much of the kilo volts is being generated when you are pressing the, depends on the settings. Okay. But you can check on, a, on the fluoroscopy machine itself, on the screen, how much of the, of the kilovolts potential is being sent each time you press. Okay. And also, uh, we, we've been doing the, um, after each procedure, the amount of r r radiation that goes to a patient. The summary of everything. You can also check how much of the radiation has been sent to, to that. That's one of the requirements that's said now. Um, principle of attenuation, the graph shows the attenuation rates on those three different materials, lead, tungsten, and the barium. And the energy is drastically decreasing. Uh, the most is with the, with the lead. Uh, summary for all procedures, judicious application of time, distance, shielding affects the dose. Appropriate use of fluoroscopy geometry includes collimating properly, um, optimizing being on time, minimizing distance between image intensifier and patient, 
ensuring sufficient distance between patient x-ray tube, optimizing exposure rates for image quality and dose. Thank you.